Lord, give us the grace to walk in the new and living way, as we just sang. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, greetings to each one of you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is such a joy to be in front of you with the Word of God, as always. Um, as we know, um, since April, we've been meditating on this topic, the new and living way, unveiled for us through the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And through Jesus, we have bought, been brought to a new covenant in which we are made new into a new creation uh, we have received new life, we have received a new heart, and we have started to produce new spiritual fruit. We are made part of a new spiritual family, the church, and he continues to transform our own earthly families. And finally, he commissions us to a new purpose. In the last three messages, the subtopic of the new purpose, we learned that we are called to be a masterpiece created in Jesus Christ for good works, that we are called to be holy and set apart, and, and all of this is so that God may be glorified. And so as we wrap up the subtopic of the new purpose, I would like to conclude with this thought, that we are called to be the community of Jesus in this broken world. And to highlight a few characteristics of what this community of Jesus should be like, I would like to read from John chapter 17, Gospel of John chapter 17, verses 13 through 26. And this is from the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Gospel of John chapter 17, verses 13 through 26. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy filled in themselves. I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you send me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so the world may know that you sent me and loved them even so you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me because before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name. And I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Through the Apostle John we, and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we are enabled to see a glimpse into the inner Trinitarian conversation from the Son to the Father for his church. And this is why in most of our Bibles we see the title of the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Jesus is our, as our high priest is interceding for us. And this, is, this could be the, very much the content of Jesus' prayers even today for us. There's a famous phrase that we think it's in the Bible, but it's, it's not uh, uh, that, that we are in this world but not of this world. But this derives from this prayer that Jesus, said, Jesus talks about that I am leaving them in the world but they are not of this world. And so God, Jesus has redeemed us and he has sent us to be in this world, but not take, be taken hold of by this world. And there's a big difference between being in the world and being of the world. Being of the world shows a sense of possession. It shows a sense of, of, of being grabbed by. And, but here we have been brought and bought and redeemed by the blood of Jesus so we cannot live as if we are of the world 
living as if we are of the world means rejecting the value of our redemption. So we have been bought at a price. And so we are not of this world, but at the same time, we are not told to be aloof and purposeless while we are here. We're not told just to wait our, our time to come, to sit and be um, fruitless, right? We're, we've been called to be in the world. So what are some of the characteristics of the community of Jesus called to be in this world? There's so many things to say, but I, uh, for the interest of time, let me highlight just three characteristics among, among many. First, the community of Jesus is compelled by love. Love for God and love for people. And let us just look at the passage we just read. John chapter 17, 23. I in them and you in me that they may be perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. So in the Gospel of John, we see in particular, you know, Gospel of John helps us to see the Father in such more vivid light. And Jesus is constantly talking about the Father, and, and, and unlike any other gospel. And so in here, in the Gospel of John in particular, the Father is shown as the Father of love. Father is full of love for His Son and for His creation. And the keystone verse that we know really well is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God so loved the world. So God was compelled by His great love for us that He gave His only begotten Son. His beloved Son. His treasured Son. His Son He was well pleased in. The Son who revealed His glory. That very Son was given for us so that we would not perish, but for those who believe in His Son that they may inherit eternal life. And so God the Father sent His Son into the world out of love. And in turn, Jesus says this in His high priestly prayer to the Father, John 17, 18, that you, as you send me into this world, I also have sent them into the world. So Jesus is imitating His Father. It's not a surprise because Jesus says in John 5, 19, for whatever the Father does, so the Son also does. Jesus is showing the characteristics of his father, the love that the father has in saying, as my father in his love for creation sent me, I also in my love for the church and the many, many generations to come to the fold, I send you, starting with my disciples into the world out of love. So as the community of Christ being sent to the four corners of the world, how are we to act? Paul crystallizes this in 2 Corinthians 5.14. For the love of Christ compels us. And this is where I get the phrase compelled by his love. That we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. So our conviction is that Jesus who died out of, uh, for all out of his great love compels us into action. So over the centuries of this, with the church being in existence, how has this love of Christ compelled many saints towards actions? Many, when many have laid down their lives for Jesus. Missionaries sent to all four corners of, of the world, starting with the apostles. Many over the years laid down their careers, their future goals. They left their families. They left their familiar circumstances. They accepted the hard life. For the sake of others. Many chose to dedicate their lives to serve the poor. To take care of the widow and the orphan. The poor were given shelter. The widows were taken care of. The orphans were welcomed into families and adopted into families. The master and slave relationships that existed from the beginning of time was transformed. The truth that every human being is created in the image of God became the rallying cry for the emancipation of, of the slaves around the world. Christianity did that. The Judeo-Christian worldview did that in terms of uplifting, downtrodden people that were untouchable, people that were, were, were ignored in society, people that were left for nothing. 
Christians being enlightened by Christ, this being compelled by the love of Christ, lifted up people that were untouchable, that were, that were counted as worthless. Now that we think about it, centuries later, we think, well, that's obvious. I mean, you're supposed to help people, right? Like, it, it is so ingrained in society that people forget that 2,000 years plus ago, that this was strange in the eyes of people at that time. This value of valuing people in the image of, in the image of God, being taking care of the poor, taking care of the needy, seeing them as equal in value and worth. Helping people that, to, to bring them up into a point, point where they can take care of themselves. All these are Christian values, all rooted in the love of Christ. And the ministry of reconciliation across the globe is still a work in progress, but reconciliation among races, reconciliation uh, among genders, um, reconciliation through the gospel. Even the concept of marriage was, was transformed by the Christian worldview. The, the whole aspect of the husband ought to love their wives as Christ loved the church and the husband giving themselves up, that was unheard of across the centuries ago. But in Christianity, 2,000 years ago, this was in the Bible, 2,000 years ago, just imagine the amount of uh, the progress that has made just through the gospel alone. And those who, by, by their own choice, that got that addicted to substances, those who uh, were in all kinds of bondages, were set free and they were helped and they were rehabilitated. That happens even today. We went there yesterday. It was just another reminder in Jesus' house, how, by the name of Jesus, right, many people there are, are coming there to get a second chance in life. And they're being helped and they're being fed and they're being taken care of and kept accountable. And they're given another chance in life to, to come closer to Christ and to go out again into the world as, as freed people from their addictions and bondages. So in all of this, we might be able to say, you know, when Jesus said, I, I don't want to take them out of the world, right? But Jesus, I, Jesus particularly prayed that I don't want to take them out of the world, but just protect them from the evil one. So Jesus could have said, Jesus, you know, Father, I'm coming to uh, restore into uh, my, glorious, uh, my, my glorious past. Can you please bring my disciples with me? And that's not what Jesus prayed. Jesus instead sent them out said, wait until you're clothed with power on high and you'll become my witnesses, right? As Christians, uh, being fearful of culture, being fearful of society, we have a tendency of, of bubbling, uh, creating this Christian bubble, you know. Um, and you, if you go across the Bible Belt, you'll see, you know, you'll see Christian-themed things, right? Christian-themed bookstores, Christian-themed stores. And, and we're taught to only taught to be in these safe spaces. But really, to be honest with you, that, is, that goes against the grain of Christ's intent for us, is that, again, we're not supposed to be of the world, but we are supposed to be in the world. We are supposed to be invested and, 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 and implanted in various corners of this globe and in the workplaces and in society so that we can be a light and of influence. Romans 10, 14, Paul says this, how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? How would people know Jesus unless some of us are sent to be there? And it doesn't have to be in the context of ministry. It could be in the context of being in the workplace, being, you know, being educated, serving in whatever form or capacity. You're being sent from here the job of the church is just to equip each one of us. But, you know, one time I was driving through a parking lot, I, I, and, and it was a church parking lot. I was trying to do a U-turn. I did a quick U-turn, and then out, out of, well, as I was getting out of the parking lot, there was a board, kind of one of those boards that you stick in the yard, and it said, now you're entering into the mission field. You know, what a reminder for those attendees of the church coming, going out of the driving park, parking lot, saying, now you're entering in your mission field. So we need to send people out of this self-created Christian bubble so that 
Many more can be added to this community of Jesus. And, and this compelling force to do this is not because we can get a good name, where we can show ourselves on social media or to gain, gain human praise. It's, it's the love of Jesus that compels us. And this, is, this ought to be a, a thought that, that comes, a, a introspection, uh, that the introspective thought that comes in our heart is, am I doing this because I'm compelled by the love of Jesus? And if, if there's a deficit of the love of Jesus, it, it's a question to ask ourselves, is that what is driving my intent for action? Second, we are uh, tempered by suffering. First is that we are compelled by love. Second, we are tempered by suffering. And the word tempered, it comes from a material uh, tempered glass. And may, maybe some of you have heard this. Um, it, you know, the process of it is, it, it, it is uh, made through a, a very pro- process of very, uh, chemical and thermal treatments and it's compressed and it's, it's created with tension and it is to avoid a scenario where say you are driving and your windshield, which if it's not tempered and some, it happened to crack, you don't want it to crack into pieces, very sharp pieces, very large sharp pieces, right? So tempered gas, glass actually enables it to, if it cracks, it just, it just it cracks into like small granular pieces. And so and I'm not, that's not my analogy. My analogy is in the process of how this type of glass is made. This glass is made stronger with, with a lot of tension and compression and a lot of thermal treatments. And similarly, the community of Jesus, we have to go through these intense seasons of suffering caused by both internal and external forces so that we are made, that, that we are refined and made stronger through it. And this is why what I mean by tempered by suffering. The community of Jesus is a community tempered by suffering. In his high priestly prayer in John 17, 14 to 15, he says, I have given them your word and the word has hated them for they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Right before Jesus prays, he tells the disciples in John chapter 16, 33, in the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. So the community of Jesus has always experienced and endured suffering by means of persecution or through normal brokenness in the world, whether it's due to the sin of man or sin, sin to self or through the broken conditions in our bodily nature. Each of us don't arrive on this earth with, with the perfect bodies. We, we are in a fallen condition. And the community of Jesus always ought to see suffering from a unique set of lens. That, and nothing makes us more unique in the world like enduring suffering well. Like suffering has a purpose. And let me just read quickly some reasons why suffering serves a purpose. One, suffering is a cause for joy. Romans 5, 3, 3 to 5 I'll just read the one verse that not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. A a joyful sufferer is a testimony of faith to this world. Second, suffering is a cause for reward. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us eternal glory that far outweighs them all. That there's a reward that is going to be the eternal glory that far outweighs the momentary, temporary the, the troubles that we have. And so this gives a, the community of Jesus a heavenly focus always. Not an earthly focus, but a heavenly focus. Third, suffering is a cause for comfort. Second Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we comfort are comforted by God. So suffering in the community of Jesus propels us to ministry. A ministry of encouragement, of comforting others. Often I, I, I think of this when, when uh, how hard it is for those who don't know Jesus to comfort somebody who is going through suffering. But unfortunately, sometimes they do a better job than even Christians to comfort those who are going through real trouble. 
But when we, have, when we go through suffering, the comfort that we receive from God is the source in which we're able to comfort others. People, uh, people are looking for something. They, they, you know, just like a, you know, finding water in an oasis, they're looking for comfort. And, and who else is better suited than Christians to comfort those who are going through suffering? And suffering in, comes to any, everyone alike, wh- wh- wherever you are, whatever, whatever you believe. Finally, suffering is a cause for Christ-likeness. Philippians 3.10 says, I may know him in the power of his resurrection. I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That, that the, as I share in his sufferings, I become him like him in his death. A life of a, a person who is Christ-like in all areas of life is like a sweet aroma to those around them. So the community of Jesus is, is shaped by the cross. Enduring suffering is is in our DNA because the blood of our Savior who suffered for us is running in and through us. It's in our we 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 ought to know how to suffer well because we are looking to Jesus who endured suffering with joy. And my last point, third, the community of Jesus is empowered by prayer. The community of Jesus is a praying community. Entire passage from John chapter 17 reveals to us that Christ's prayer to the Father and, and it shows to us the deep intimacy Jesus had with his Father. And, and you know, so what else can we see in Jesus' teaching when it comes to the power of prayer? At the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was praying and the disciples were struggling to stay awake, Jesus, what did Jesus say? Matthew chapter 26, 40 to 41. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me in one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So what is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying that the prayer has the power of strengthening us against temptation. Jesus is telling Peter, Peter, if you are able to pray, you might be able to withstand the temptation that you're about to face in denying me three times. As we read through the Gospels, we, we, we see the Gospel writers highlighting moments where Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed in the early morning. Jesus prayed through the night. Jesus prayed in private. Jesus prayed in front of the disciples. He taught them how to pray. Jesus prayed in front of the crowd when, before resurrecting Lazarus. Prayer was an integral part in Jesus' life. And we see the practices of Jesus when it comes to prayer handed, to the, or handed, over to the, handed down to the disciples in the book of Acts. And, and uh, I'm not going to take much time there because of, of time running out. But they were, we see over and over again, they were in one mind, devoted themselves to prayer. The apostles said, this is before the day of Pentecost. All in one room, together, one mind, praying and devoting themselves to prayer. Continually devoting. Jesus, and then they say, and when they handed over to the, the ministry of Serving the tables, they, what did they say? They said, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. They, they saw prayer as an important component in their life and in the ministry. When Peter and John were first arrested and they were let go and they were warned against preaching, what did the church do in Acts chapter 4? They lifted their voices to God with one accord. And then what, at the end, what happened? Acts 4.31, when they had prayed, the place in which they gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And so as we are entering the fasting prayer season tomorrow, I'm asking especially our younger brothers and sisters to let a, let a new commitment for prayer arise in each one of us. That the community of Jesus is a community of prayer. That we model after the prayer life of Jesus. And as the worship team comes up, let, us, let me ask some questions. Do we sense Christ's love compelling us to action? In other sense, what is our motivation to do the works God has called us to do? Second, how do we endure trials and suffering? Are we seeing ourselves refined by the fire and we're enduring with joy? Or are we 
distancing ourselves from the Lord? Are we harboring a hatred to the Lord due to the trials and suffering going on in our life? Thirdly, do we have a dynamic prayer life? Where are we, exper- are we experiencing the presence and power of Christ when we spend that sweet hour of prayer or that what, whatever time that we spend with the Lord? Do we, are we able to sense the power and presence of Christ? So re- let's remember what purpose we were called to. That every community of Jesus across the globe beams in the spiritual realm if we could see it they in the light of the knowledge of the glory of God found in the face of Jesus and as Paul says in Philippians chapter 12 the chapter 2 verses 15 and there's a graphic to show this that we are to shine like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people Jesus said that we are the light of the world and we are to collectively show a new and living way marked by the teachings of Jesus. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace. We thank you, God, that you have called us into this new and living way. Lord, we pray that you would give us a kind of love that compels us to action, Lord. Lord, give us, O oh Lord, a, a, a sense of, Lord, a, a, a longing, O oh Lord, to, to see you face to face, O oh Lord God. Lord, give us an a, a ability to suffer well, Lord. And Lord, we pray, oh God, that, Lord, that we will have a sense of passion, oh Lord, for prayer. Lord, as we are entering as a church body together in these next 21 days, I pray, oh Lord God, that you will awaken us, oh God. Lord, awaken our spirit, oh God. Awaken our souls, oh Lord. Lord, awaken uh, those of us, oh God, who uh, have been slumbering. And I pray that, that, that there will be a, a new sense of life coming out of us, O oh Lord, as we gather together to pray and seek your face. We pray to you and thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.